Hello, everyone. My name is Wendy Myers of MyersDetox.com. Thanks so much for joining me on today's podcast. We have my good friend Ari Witten on the show of TheEnergyBlueprint.com, and he has written a book called Red Light Therapy, The Ultimate Guide to Red Light Therapy. And we are going to be talking about uh, obviously red light therapy and near infrared therapy, far infrared therapy, the difference between that and the sun, I give you lots of tips and tricks for using near infrared and red light panels. And does red and near infrared light actually detox you or is it actually far infrared that detoxes you? Uh, lots of really interesting information, information you haven't heard before. We're going to make a lot of distinctions uh, about the benefits and uh, myths of red light therapy and near infrared therapy and far infrared therapy. Fantastic show today. I know that so many of you listening are suffering from chronic fatigue or other uh, serious health issues and are searching for answers. That's why you're listening to this podcast. I've worked with thousands of clients and their number one complaint was fatigue. So my goal has been to find a way to help people improve their energy production in their body. And I researched toxic metals. And in my research in conjunction with Dr. Bruce Jones, I found that there were certain metals like arsenic, aluminum, tin, thallium, and cesium that are very prevalent in people today that interfere in your body's ability to produce energy. And when you remove these metals from the body, people have increased energy production, increased uh, ability to exercise, improved ability to lose weight, better sleep, they have better mood as a result, and they have the energy they need to heal their body. Healing is a very energy intensive process. So improving mitochondrial function, which uh, the mitochondria are our body's little power powerhouses, they produce our body's energy is the key to improving energy production and improving your health. So I develop a very simple three-step uh, supplement kit, a three-step system called the mitochondria detox that involves a binder. It involves activated silica that helps to grab onto metals that cause fatigue and remove them. And it's a very simple, inexpensive kit that you can get to help improve your energy levels. So if you want to learn more about that, go to mitochondriadetox.com to learn more. Ari Witten is a best-selling author, a nutrition and lifestyle expert, and the founder of the Energy Blueprint course. He has been studying and teaching health science for over 20 years. He is a Bachelor of Science in Kinesiology and recently completed the coursework for his PhD in clinical psychology. For the last five years, he's teamed up with world-renowned scientists and physicians to develop the Energy Blueprint System, which is a powerful evidence-based system for overcoming fatigue and increasing energy levels. You can learn more about his work at theenergyblueprint.com. Ari, thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Why don't you tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and how you came to do what you're doing? Yeah, well, I'll uh, I'll summarize this pretty quickly here. Obviously, we could probably spend an hour talking about all the details of this, but um, you know, I, I was in I was into health from a pretty young age. Uh, I started as a 13 year old when I got into fitness and bodybuilding and started studying nutrition and exercise physiology and biomechanics very intensively. And, you know, at that time, my goals were pretty superficial. I just wanted to build muscles and get biceps and abs and, <laughs> thing. and, and so fat loss, muscle gain, body composition, physical fitness, that was my world for about 10 years. Um, and, and it was still my passion. I went on to do a degree, my, my undergraduate degree in kinesiology, um, and then I, you know, still was studying nutrition and physiology very intensively for about a decade. Um, I went on to medical school, thought I wanted to be an MD, absolutely hated it. Mm. Uh, medical school, I mean, just having gone into that environment after studying nutrition and, 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 and holistic health for a decade, uh, just wasn't a good environment for me because... They don't teach you a single class on nutrition or lifestyle and how that plays a role in any of these diseases. So I was I was literally in the hospital working with people with diabetes or heart disease, um, you know, which are diseases of lifestyle. 
And these seeing these people who are on 12 or 15 different medications um, and no, not a single person is telling them anything about nutrition or lifestyle and how that's playing a role in their condition or playing a role in, in the path to get better. Um, and, and so, I mean, it was just, it was maddening to me to be in that kind of environment. Made a very, very tough decision to leave. One of the hardest, probably the hardest decision of my life to do that because I, I dreamed of being a doctor up till that point. Um, spent about a year or so not really knowing where I wanted to go from there. Uh, then decided to do a PhD program in clinical psychology. I went on, did, did all three years of coursework in the PhD program. Then at the end of it, realized I didn't really want to be a clinical psychologist <laughs> because you know, I started to find out things like, oh, well, once you get your license, then you actually are limited from practicing, for example, nutrition in your practice. And they can actually revoke your, your license for practicing outside of the scope of what that, that credential qualifies you for. So I actually realized very counterintuitively that not having that credential actually opened up more possibilities for me to practice the way I wanted to practice. Yeah, with, I, know pe I know people that give up their, their medical license so that they can practice the way they want. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, I kind of went through five years of, I mean, uh, four years of undergraduate and then uh, five years of, of graduate school and uh, and realized I didn't really want to do those things. And then basically started teaching people about health the way that I wanted to teach people about health. Uh, and that was in about 2012. Uh, prior to that, I was a personal trainer and nutritionist for many years. And, um, and in 2012, I started building my online business and have been doing that ever since. And then for the last four years, um, I've been doing the Energy Blueprint. That's the name of my brand. And the system that I've developed with the help of a lot of different researchers and, and physicians um, to help people overcome fatigue and increase their energy levels. Yeah. And I think it's a, such a fantastic program. Um, you have, you're so intelligent. You have so much amazing research based information on why people are chronically fatigued and how to regain their energy levels in that program. It's the energy blueprint.com. It's amazing. I highly recommend it. And Thank so, I'm sorry. I said thank you. I really appreciate that. Yeah. And so we talk a lot about on this podcast about energy and fatigue and, and how to remedy those issues. So I'm, I'm really admire the work that you do thank and what, you, you, what you've accomplished. Yeah. Yeah. You're, well, I've learned a lot from you and your work in, uh, in heavy metals and detoxification. Thank you. Yeah. So let's talk today about uh, red light therapy. So you have a new book out called Red Light Therapy, and it's a fantastic book. This is such a popular subject. I was actually looking the other day on my YouTube channel. The most popular videos were about infrared saunas and red light therapy, and my two most popular blog posts are about the same thing. Uh, people want to know about infrared saunas and red light therapy. So we're, we're going to make some distinctions today and dispel, dispel a lot of myths and misinformation about infrared saunas and red light therapy. So first, let's talk about why our bodies need light in the first place. Just set some foundation. Yeah, well, you know, a real quick digression. Um, since I published my, my book on July 10th, it's actually been plagiarized six times. <laughs> so, so yes, you're correct. It's a very popular field. Um, but uh, so so why do, why do humans need light? Yeah, this is, a I think, a really nice introduction to this, this whole field, because most people really do not think about light in this way. We think of light as like, oh, I turn on a light switch to see things. Light is the opposite of darkness. Light is, you know, what happens during the daytime when the sun is out. We think of it as a, in a visual context in this sort of light versus darkness way. What, what people don't realize is that there are actually numerous different kinds of light that have effects on our biology that are called that are that are bioactive wavelengths of light. So a couple of these people have some familiarity with. Maybe they don't they don't they haven't really connected the dots. They don't really know what I'm talking about yet, but everybody knows about vitamin D, right? Vitamin D from UV light from the sun. UV light hits our skin and then creates different biochemical reactions that result in cholesterol essentially being turned into 
vitamin D. And vitamin D, of course, controls thousands of, of the expression of thousands of different genes in our body, immune function, the health of lots of different aspects of our body. So that's just one of the, the types of wavelengths of light that is bioactive in humans. One other one that people maybe have some familiarity with now, it's being more talked about in the last five years. Um, uh, hopefully I've contributed to that. This is something I've talked a lot about in the last five years or so, which is circadian rhythm. So circadian rhythm is our biological clock in our brains. And it's, it's pretty much literally a 24 hour clock that is set in response mainly to the rise and fall of the sun. And that, if this sounds like kind of a weird abstract idea, just think about the fact that every night, for some reason, through no volition of your own, you all of a sudden get tired and sleepy and then go to sleep and then spend seven or eight or nine hours in a totally different state of consciousness. And then all of a sudden the next morning, through no volition of your own, you wake up and all of a sudden feel more energy and a desire to get out of bed and go do things. Well, all of that is being orchestrated by the circadian clock in our brains that's regulating all sorts of different neurotransmitters and hormones and all kinds of different biochemical reactions in our body. Um, and, it, you know, just that one topic, it, there's an enormous amount of complexity. There's a, a mountain of science going into all sorts of nuances of that. But that's the basic idea of it is we have this clock in our brain and it's primarily regulated by the rise and fall of the sun. Specifically, mainly blue wavelengths of light, also to some extent green wavelengths of light, but blue wavelengths of light actually get into our eyeballs, feed back through nerves into what's called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. That's the place where the circadian clock in your brain is. And then uh, from there, basically, that's the signal that tells your brain, oh, there's blue light present. That means it's daytime, the time to be awake, alert, active, energetic. Okay. And then it Create, it creates all sorts of different effects on various neurotransmitters and hormones that control energy levels, appetite, metabolism, um, motivation, you know, lots and lots of different functions, the functions of various organ systems and so on. Um, so that's, again, that's blue wavelengths of light. Now, if, if blue light sounds weird to you, just think of you look outside and you look at the sky, the sky is blue that is because blue wavelengths of light are entering your eyeball. So that's blue light. Um, and it's really, it should be only present um, during the daytime. Okay. In a, in a natural context, the context of our ancestors prior to the invention of artificial light, blue light was really only present during the day. Okay. We won't, I'll, I'll leave that topic there for now. I don't want to digress too much, but basically we have these two kinds of light that I've mentioned so far, UV light, vitamin D in the skin, blue light, setting the circadian clock in the brain, regulating all sorts of neurotransmitters and hormones. You People have par probably also read about artificial light at night and the need for blue blockers and, you know, kind of low blue light mode on your, your iPhone and your iPad and things like that. Well, that's because you're trying to eliminate those blue wavelengths of light at night when you shouldn't have them in order to preserve uh, a healthy function of your circadian clock. Okay, so that's two wavelengths of light, UV, blue. In addition to that, there are actually three others. So we have far infrared, which we feel as heat. So when we go out into the sun and we feel the sun heating up our body and maybe even causing us to sweat, well, that's mainly from far infrared light that's actually penetrating into our body, heating us up from the inside out. Uh, there's an, an enormous amount of literature on that as far as stimulating blood flow and, and dilation of the capillaries. Uh, if you're sweating in the context of, let's say, far infrared saunas, uh, that's, of course, going to help with detoxification, as, as you talk about extensively. Um, and there, there are a number of other potential effects associated with that on blood pressure and, and cardiovascular health and, and things of that nature. Then there are two other kinds of light that are bioactive in humans that are affecting the way our cells and our bodies function. And I kind of lump these together because they're, even though they're technically different wavelengths of light, one is invisible to the human eye, one is visible to the human eye, um, they're, they're actually functioning the same at a biological level. And these are red light 
which is literally visible red light that you can see with your eyes and uh, near infrared light, which is just next to that spectrum of, of red light. And that's invisible to the human eyes. Now, a, a real, real quick digression so I can explain that, you know, when I say it's next to that next to red on the spectrum, if you guys do a Google image search of electromagnetic spectrum, what you'll see is basically a range of, of all of this electro various types of electromagnetic energy. So on one end, we have things like X-rays and gamma rays. These are very, very small wavelengths. Then we go up the spectrum a little bit and we get into um, so we start to get into UV light and then we get into the visible light spectrum. This, this is electromagnetic energy that humans can see with our eyes. And these are the colors of light. So you remember studying in, a, in elementary school, Roy G. Biv, you know, if you pass sunlight through a prism, it creates a, a rainbow. Or if you just see a rainbow, it's the colors of the rainbow are Roy G. Biv. That's the colors of the visible light spectrum. So that's red, orange, yellow, uh, green, blue, indigo, violet. And the violet kind of meshes with UV. Now, it's actually... In the context of this electromagnetic spectrum, in terms of the, the wavelengths, it's actually flipped. So it's actually first violet, then indigo, then blue, green, yellow, orange, red. And then once you get out of that visible spectrum, then you get into near infrared energy, then far infrared energy. Then you get into things like microwaves, like what your microwave at home uses. And then things like radio waves, which are really big wavelengths. That's literally what you what's broadcast on the radio. Okay, so that's the big picture of the electromagnetic spectrum. Now, a lot of these different things have activity on a biological level, including things like X-rays or gamma rays, um, which can damage our DNA quite easily and can be quite toxic to us. But within the therapeutic stuff, that's where we get into UV, blue, um, red, near-infrared, far-infrared. Those are the, the key players as far as bioactive wavelengths. So, you know... Basically, to, to sum this up, it's, it's basically a huge reframe for people who are used to thinking of light as just, oh, light, I turn on a light switch and now I can see things. Light is the opposite of darkness. Well, now we know that there's many different types of wavelengths of, of light that are bioactive in us and that humans actually need. This is an important point. Humans need optimal doses of all five of these different bioactive types of light in order to express optimal health. And one more point on that, in the modern world we live in, very, very few people are actually getting proper doses of those types of light. We live in an, an environment that is um, what I call malillumination, okay? And, and that's basically the, the nutrition equivalent or the, I should say the nutrition equivalent of malillumination is malnutrition, right? And everybody knows what that is. That's when you eat a, a crappy diet or you're like literally malnourished either because you're starving or you're just eating a diet that is totally inadequate, that is not giving you the nutrients you need. Well, if you're not getting the light nutrients that you need uh, from proper light exposure habits, then you end up with malillumination. And most people don't realize that you know, there, there's a big body of scientific research showing that that may be close to as harmful as the effects of eating a crappy diet. So um, light exposure is a very, very big deal to our health. And we need, again, we need adequate exposure to these different types of light in order to express optimal health. So let's talk about some of the, the ideal light wavelengths that are bioactive in humans that positively affect our cells, our mitochondria, which are our little cells powerhouses that make our energy in our body is just overall. Okay. So within these five bioactive wavelengths that I just talked about, there, there's kind of an interesting phenomenon. And um, this, it's, it's, it seems kind of peculiar, but then it seems to make more sense as we, we explain the different layers of this. Here's what I mean. Um, if we look at the penetration of different light uh, to wavelengths of light into the human body, most of the wavelengths of light, so for example, the, the colors of the rainbow, um, so you know UV light and and purple light and blue light and uh, yellow and orange and green, 
they all pretty much get stopped on the surface of our body. They really don't penetrate deeply into our body. They stay really on the surface and, and they kind of just get absorbed into the skin and don't make it beyond that. So if that's the case, it's really hard for any type of light to have really significant biological effects directly on the cells in a particular area if it's getting if all that light's getting stopped at the level of the skin. Now it, we still have some effects, right? Because UV light actually creates vitamin D in our skin, which gets absorbed into our bloodstream and gets pumped throughout our whole body. So it gets systemic that way. But most of these other types of light really just gets get blocked there and they kind of don't really do anything beyond just hitting the skin and getting absorbed uh, at the level of the skin. Now, red and near infrared light are very unique in the sense that they don't get blocked by the skin. They actually penetrate very deeply into our bodies. Uh, they can penetrate, some estimates are two or three inches into our body. Now, when you were a kid, you probably remember taking a flashlight and shining it through your, your hand or your fingers and being able to see light coming through there. Well, if you remember, or you can actually do this experiment now, um, you'll notice that it's specifically red light that actually makes it through. The other colors get blocked. So it's, you, can, you don't shine a flashlight against your hand and then see blue light coming through. Not going to happen because that blue light's getting absorbed in your, in your skin. So it's red light that makes it through. Near infrared also makes it through. But again, that's invisible to the human eyes. Um, so that's, that's quite an interesting thing, right? The, just the simple fact that red and near infrared light are able to penetrate very deeply into our bodies. Now, now in addition to that, they don't just penetrate through the, the layer of the skin. They actually penetrate through cells. They can actually go entirely through cells in your body and go layers and layers and layers deep, literally more than two inches deep in your body. Um, and that's, I don't know how many, maybe that's um, millions of cell layers deep. If it's two inches, I don't, I don't know how the math works out, but maybe something to that effect. So it can affect cells through your body in a huge, huge way, just by virtue of the fact that it can penetrate that deeply. Now, what is it, what is it doing once it gets there? Well, Red and near infrared light, the way that they work, you know, I told you about UV light and vitamin D, blue light and the circadian rhythm, and, and we talked about uh, far infrared, and, and we talked about, and then, and then now it's red and near infrared light. So what are those doing on a cellular level? Well, it turns out that they may do a few different things, but primarily what's going on is they stimulate the mitochondria in our cells, which are our cells energy generators. That's This is what's responsible for generating pretty much all of the energy needed by all of your cells to function, whether it's your brain cells, your heart cells, your liver cells, your muscle cells, every organ and your gland and, and gland in your body, every cell in your body depends on the energy produced by mitochondria inside those cells turns out that red and near infrared light actually enhance mitochondrial energy production. So uh, that's, that's the fundamental mechanism by which they work. Now, basically, you know, when, when we're probably going to dig into this a bit, but red and near infrared light have this kind of seemingly like panacea like quality that they can, there's all this positive research on so many different things from skin anti-aging to muscular performance, athletic performance, to, to fat loss, to brain enhancement and, and healing of, of brain injuries, um, to literally like dozens of other different types of effects, effects on pain and inflammation and all sorts of different things. And there are actually people who look at that and go, something's fishy here. This, this is like, this seems kind of weird that one particular treatment or type of therapy would be beneficial for like dozens of different conditions that are like totally different. It's, it's kind of bizarre and it almost makes people think this might be snake oil, you know, something's not right here. And the reason why, again, is just that pretty much every system in your body, whether it's a gland, an organ, um, muscles, a a anything, your skin, um, the health of those cells depends very directly on the efficiency of energy production by the mitochondria in those cells. Good energy production inside skin cells or brain cells or heart cells means healthier skin or brain or heart. 
And so that's that's fundamentally why it can impact all of these different systems and all these different conditions in the body in a positive way is because we're, we're getting at something that is universally beneficial to every type of cell in our body, no matter what it does, which is that if a cell has more energy, it will work better. Let's talk about why somebody would want to expose themselves to red light or to near infrared light or far infrared light like they would find with a sauna, an infrared sauna. Yeah, well, you know, that uh, very interesting question. There's a lot of nuances to this, but there's a range of different potential goals that this can help facilitate. So, for example, you, do you want to lose fat? Well, there's research showing that red and near infrared light therapy can enhance fat loss. There's something called laser liposuction, uh, which there's certain clinics that use laser directly on fatty areas. But there's also research showing that l that red and near infrared light, and by the way, that, that laser that I'm talking about is actually red or near infrared light in, in the form of a laser beam. So it can either be concentrated in what's called coherent light, which is a beam of light of, of from a laser, or it can be more incoherent light, diffuse light um, from like things like LED panels, for example, or uh, potentially incandescent bulbs and things like that. So there, and by the way, uh, there's research that has compared the effects of those two things. It used to be thought that you needed laser for a lot of these benefits. And, and uh, you know, there was kind of this aura surrounding it. Like you had to go to a clinic where they had one of these lasers to use it. Well, one of the big breakthroughs in the last five or 10 years is that research has shown that uh, non-laser light, incoherent light from things like LED panels can basically have pretty much all of the same effects as laser light. So anyway, little digression, but fat loss, one example of this, um, in addition to the liposuction type of treatments, the laser liposuction, it's not actually like surgery, um, non-surgical liposuction, you could call it. There's also just research showing that red and near infrared light therapy can be paired with things like exercise and nutrition interventions and can actually greatly enhance the fat loss benefits of those. So you see there's even some research showing about 200 percent improvements in the amounts of fat loss uh, compared to uh, an exercise intervention that didn't also use red and near infrared light. So that's just one example. Another example is um, muscle performance and, and adaptations to exercise on that front. So for example, somebody's weight training or doing cardio, well, there are studies that have compared those exercise interventions with and without doing also red or near infrared light therapy. And by doing red and near infrared light therapy, you see much bigger improvements in insulin sensitivity, greater gains in strength, greater gains, gains in endurance, um, using it before the athletic event, for example, you can you can enhance performance. Uh, using it after, you can enhance the speed of recovery, so you're sore and in pain less long, and um, and you can get back in the gym or do more workouts sooner. So those are just two benefits on sort of body composition. But there's also uh, brain benefits. They're using this in the context of treating depression, anxiety neurodegenerative diseases, just enhancing cognitive performance and, and mood. Um, they're using it in the context of treating traumatic brain injuries. They are, uh, we're, we're also, we can use this in the context of skin anti-aging. This is a very, very popular one. And there are actually anti-aging uh, clinics and, and spas that use these services and will charge you $75 or $100 per session uh, to sit in front of one of these lights or lay in, in on one of these lights for, um, you know, for half an hour, let's say. So what does it do for skin anti-aging? Well, it stimulates collagen and elastin production primarily. So, and, and that's largely as a result of, you know, enhancing mitochondrial energy production in the cells that produce collagen and elastin. So there's a whole bunch of research showing that it decreases wrinkles, um, enhance, enhances skin firmness, decreases cellulite, uh, and, and so on, a range of different anti-aging benefits. Um, what else? There's, there's so much more to this. There's, there's a number of more obscure uh, sort of, you know, contexts of treating, for example, diabetic ulcers and healing of hard to heal wounds. Wound healing is a big one, whether it's bone healing or skin healing, um, enhancing different uh, function of different organs. There's also uh, a number of studies that have used this in the context of 
of Hashimoto's hypothyroidism and shown uh, really amazing benefits in terms of how many people are able to wean off and reduce their doses of uh, thyroid medications while maintaining normal thyroid hormone levels, as well as um, so, uh, uh, there's a few studies that have even shown that a portion of people uh, are able to completely get off of thyroid hormone medication uh, and maintain normal thyroid hormones. So there's a range of different benefits for the brain, for the muscles, for fat loss, for skin anti-aging. I think those are those are the big ones. There's also pain relief and anti-inflammatory uh, effects. But I, I would say those are probably the big ones, the most common uses for this technology. And that's for the, the near infrared and red light for Correct. most of the benefits for both of those? Yes. And let's talk a little bit. Um, do those spectrums help to detox heavy metals and chemicals? Let's talk a little about that because I think there's some confusion questions I've gotten with these uh, near infrared and red light panels if they detox your body. Yeah. So in terms of actual research, probably almost nothing to show that directly. Um, and I, to my knowledge, maybe hasn't even been studied. Um, now, where, where most of that's going to come in is probably in the context of far infrared and actually stimulating sweating. Um, and sweating, uh, as obviously, as you talk about, is, is a powerful method of detoxification. And there's a whole bunch of research showing that using saunas, whether traditional saunas, infrared saunas, just sweating uh, itself is a powerful method of helping our body to, to purge toxins. Now, there's one potential area that might be an exception to this, um, which is, well, maybe a couple areas. One is that there's some research showing that red and near infrared light can enhance liver health. So if you're if you're lean enough for that light to actually reach your liver uh, directly, and that means just that you don't have a, a huge layer of fat over your liver, um, then that light can actually potentially directly act on your liver, and that may enhance detoxification. There there is some studies, mostly animal studies, showing that it can enhance liver health. Um, the one other aspect of this. And we can start to talk about mechanisms of what this is actually doing on a cellular level. That, that might be a, an interesting conversation to get into. But um, one of the things that this is doing is actually building up the, it's what's it's something called the antioxidant response element in our cells and really in our, in our mitochondria. And this is an internal system that we have that helps to uh, to quell excess oxidants and, and inflammatory compounds in and around the cellular environment. Um, now, that system is also intimately intertwined with, for example, glutathione. Um, and, and so when we build up our internal antioxidant defense system, that entails part of what that's doing is actually building up our internal stores of glutathione, which is a powerful uh, compound involved in the detoxification process. Um, so you can kind of theoretically connect the dots, even though we don't have research directly testing red and near infrared light on detoxification of heavy metals, for example, you can kind of just connect the dots. And based on understanding those mechanisms, you go, well, if it's not, even if it's not directly, you know, sort of purging heavy metals from my system, it's at the very least helping my cells be better able to deal with these toxins and get rid of them. Yeah, and also the near infrared bulb saunas, they're called near infrared bulb saunas. They are actually emitting mostly far infrared light. And so Correct. that's why they are hot. They heat you up and facilitate detox, even though they're typically referred to or called near infrared bulbs. Yes, that's correct. And, th and this is kind of a misnomer. This is something I talk about in my book uh, kind of extensively. But basically, there's there's companies out there that kind of talk about their saunas as near infrared saunas um, and even some that kind of try to make the distinction of between near infrared saunas versus far infrared and, and saying their near infrared saunas are better because near infrared is better for you than far infrared. Well, you know, all of that is kind of nonsense because near infrared by itself does not heat up your body. So if you, if you had truly a real uh, genuine sort of near infrared sauna that was just a, a wooden box that emitted only near infrared light, well, it would just be a wooden box that is completely at room temperature that's emitting <laughs> in, invisible light. There's no heat element to that. Yeah. So the heat comes in, the sauna aspect of it comes in when you introduce far infrared energy to it. So 
Uh, this can be there. Are, there, are, there are sauna companies like Sunlight and or Clearlight make saunas that have far infrared emitters and they also have near infrared LEDs in, in them. Or there are companies like Sauna Space that use the incandescent style heat lamps, which they call kind of near infrared. And many companies that make these call near infrared emitters, um, but they actually emit red and near infrared and lots of far infrared energy. They're actually mostly far infrared energy and they're emitting mostly heat. And that's why they make you hot. And that's why they create a sauna effect. So, you know, there's some kind of tricky language that people use and, and some misnomers there. Um, but those lights do also emit uh, near infrared and red light. Yeah. And, and thankfully, because they, they, they do help to detox you. <laughs> yes. And so let's talk about some difference between, um, you know, the far infrared or near infrared saunas, whether they be the lamp saunas or the sunlight and with the far infrared emitters and the LEDs. So let's talk about some of the differences between those and some of the, the benefits or pros and cons. Sure. So as I just said, the, the, the heat lamp style bulbs do emit red and near infrared. Now there's kind of debate back and forth. You know, there's one company out there that makes um, red and near infrared LEDs. That's, that's called Juve that wrote an article basically trying to take down sauna space and the, the companies that make these heat lamps uh, saying, Hey, you know, these don't emit enough red and near infrared light mm -hmm. to even be effective. Mm -hmm. Um, and in terms of red and near infrared light therapy, then sauna space actually wrote a rebuttal article to them, you know, <laughs> with their own measurements, um, showing that like, Hey, actually they do emit enough red and, 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 and near infrared light to be therapeutic. And the dose is high enough. Um, I agree with sauna space. Sauna space, uh, is, is saying, is speaking the truth on that. However, um, there are some nuances here that are somewhat important, which, which is, in order to do red and near infrared light properly, you need kind of a few things in place. The dose is important and the dose uh, needs to be different according to exactly what goal you're trying to use it for. So, for example, um, skin anti-aging on the face requires a much lower dose and usually you'd want to be at a further distance away from the light as compared with uh, treating like deep tissues like organs and glands and the brain and the muscles and fat tissue and things like that. Um, so the dosing parameters for like where you would use that light from, well, with, with an LED panel, you can control that very precisely and you know your numbers of exactly how much you're, you're getting and you know what the proper dosing range is. So you can get the proper dose for skin anti-aging on your face and um, use the light from a much closer distance uh, for things like treating deep tissues like muscles and glands and, and so on and tendons. And that's important because in order to treat those deep tissues properly, you really do need the light source to be close to your body and you need a, a pretty high dose of that as compared to like treating anti-aging in the skin, you need a much, much lower dose. OK, so there's some dosing parameters that are really important here. Now, one, one other aspect of this that gets complicating when you start to use the saunas is that when you're introducing a sauna element to it, you're now introducing far infrared and the sweating. So that's great. There's a huge amount of health benefits just associated with sauna use. And I, I'm a huge advocate of sauna use. But the, the problem here is that the dosing that you would need for a sauna, the amount of time that you'd want to sit in front of those heat lamps and sweat it out and get the sort of benefits of, of sauna use and feeling hot and sweaty may not be the same in terms of the right dosing as for skin anti-aging on your face or treating deep tissues uh, in, in your muscles or tendons or glands and, and organs and so on. Um, so it, it can be done at, well, actually there's, there's one other element to it. That's another complicating factor, which is with the heat lamp bulbs, um, they, the light intensity and thus the dosage varies pretty dramatically, depending on whether you're talking about the directly in front of the light. So for example, if the, the, the bulb is here, the light intensity directly straight out from that is pretty high. But as soon as I go at angles from it, like up here or down here, 
at let's say a 45 degree angle from that bulb, the light intensity drops off dramatically. So as opposed to an LED lamp, which emits cons a consistent uh, power intensity or, or um, light intensity uh, across that whole surface of the light. So there's a difference there too that also kind of further makes dosing somewhat complicated. Um, despite these different complications, I would say it can potentially still be done, but you're probably like in, or, in order to do it right, you probably don't want to just sit in front of the same position, in, in front of the heat lamps in the same exact body position. You probably want to be kind of rotating to a few different body positions and have the heat lamps on different parts of your body. Otherwise, you're probably getting, uh, to, assuming you're sitting in the sauna for, you know, 20 minutes or more, you're probably getting too much red and near infrared light on one particular area. So, Again, it, despite the complications, it can be done. It's just you have to have some awareness of kind of how to rotate your body at different intervals during that sauna session. Yeah, I, so, tell, people, I tell people to rotate like a rotisserie chicken, you yeah. know, like just keep continue rotating and to get, you know, ideal benefits. Yeah, so that's a good general guideline to help avoid um, the, you, the potentially like overdosing on red and near infrared light in any one particular area. Yeah, so let's talk about the sauna versus the sun. So the sun emits a full spectrum of light near, mid, and far infrared. Um, let's talk a little bit about some of the differences between sun exposure and doing a near or near infrared and red light therapy or going in a sauna. Yeah, so I would say there's a couple distinct differences. Um, with sunlight, you're getting, I'd say the main benefits are that you're getting UV light and vitamin D and also something called cholesterol sulfate, which there's quite a, quite a, 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 a sizable amount of research showing that cholesterol sulfate, which is another compound that are, is synthesized in our skin um, in response to UV light exposure, is also a very, very important compound in health. So vitamin D, cholesterol sulfate, the blue light and the effects on circadian rhythm, which affect a whole bunch of different neurotransmitters and hormones. Um, so those are all things that you're going to get from sunlight that you're not going to get from, let's say, a far infrared sauna or even a far infrared sauna plus a near infrared sauna. Um, on the other hand, one of the things that we do get very powerfully from saunas um, whether traditional saunas or infrared saunas is heat hormesis. And that is um, basically heating up our body to a very high degree that it actually creates a temporary metabolic stress, uh, which sounds like a bad thing. People associate stress with bad things. Um, but just think of it this way, this, this type of hormesis or temporary metabolic stress um, exercise is also that exact same concept. Exercise is not something intrinsically healthful. It's something that is creating a temporary metabolic stress. And by virtue of doing that, it stimulates certain adapt adaptive mechanisms in our bodies. And those adaptations to that type of temporary stress are what ultimately confer all of the benefits that we know that, you know, the mountain of thousands of studies that we know uh, of, are showing that exercise has all these benefits for prevention of neurodegenerative diseases, cardiovascular diseases, obesity, insulin resistance, and diabetes, um, on and on and on, just to name a few, right? And, and in, increases longevity and so on. So, you know, it's kind of an odd thing to think about that something that is actually a stressor on your body um, would confer all of these health benefits and extension of longevity and resistance to disease and resilience to various kinds of other stressors. But that's exactly what's going on. So when, when certain kinds of stressors are applied in the right way, in the right dose, then they actually lead to adaptations that make us stronger and healthier and live longer and more resistant to disease and more resilient to stress. Exercise does it. Heat does it in the context of a sauna use, whether infrared or traditional. Um, heat does it very strongly. There's amazing research on the benefits of sauna use. And... We didn't talk about this earlier. We can go into the mechanisms of red and near infrared light, but but red and near infrared light actually work also by hormesis. That's one of the mechanisms that they work by. Uh, in, a, in addition to directly stimulating uh, mitochondrial energy production, they also create a temporary metabolic stress that um, stimulates 
it actually creates a burst of inflammation to a very small degree. And that little burst, that trigger of inflammation um, on a very small level actually creates a very robust response at the cellular level uh, of something called the NRF2 pathway. And that is what builds up the what's called the ARE, the antioxidant response element. And that is our internal antioxidant defense system um, that helps protect ourselves and our mitochondria from oxidative stress, from different types of stressors, and actually makes us more resilient to stressors. And, and ultimately what that means is resistance to disease and extension of longevity and uh, greater energy levels, and especially greater energy levels in the context of the stressors that we're all being bombarded with. So that type of, of hormesis, it was a, you know, that's kind of a, a, a very broad overview of this concept and how it relates to a lot of different things we've been discussing. But um, in the context of sauna use versus sunlight specifically, by, by doing this in the context of sauna and really heating up your body very strongly, you're getting that heat hormesis effect. You're also potentially sweating more. You, you know, if you compare sun exposure in a you know, you're going for a, a run or a long distance bike ride or something in the hot sun on a 115 degree day in Phoenix, maybe, <laughs> maybe there aren't that big difference differences because you're still going to stimulate that heat hormesis pathway just being outdoors in the sun. You're also going to be sweating a lot. So at that point, some of the differences start to dissolve a little bit. But in general, um, with a sauna, you're getting more of a heat hormesis effect and you're getting more of a sweating and the purging of toxins through, through the sweating as well. Yeah. So that's fantastic. So we've got the benefits of the near infrared and the red light therapy benefits of far infrared, which you'd find in, in a sauna for detoxification, other benefits. So let's talk about some of your, your, like your ideal tips, like what is the ideal amount of sun exposure and then near and near infrared and red light exposure and sauna exposure for with the far infrared? Yeah, good questions. And it, it, the truth is that the answers are somewhat complicated um, because it depends a little bit on the individual and where they live and how much sun they're getting. Um, so let's say, for example, somebody is living a hunter-gatherer lifestyle. There's there's still hunter-gatherers in the world today. Um, you know, like there are hunter-gatherer tribes in Africa and South America and in the South Pacific and so on. Um, so if somebody's living in a hot, tropical, equatorial environment, spending hours and hours and hours a day in the sun um, and sweating and doing physical activity, you know, they're their ideal dosages of, let's say, sauna exposure or red and near infrared light therapy are going to be very, very different from the average Westerner who's spending all day indoors, getting minimal to no sun exposure and so on. Does that, does that make sense? Absolutely. But they're not listening to this podcast <laughs> and they don't need Fair sauna. Enough. So, <laughs> so yeah. And, and even within the average Westerner, like, are we talking about somebody who lives in Seattle or Norway or the UK where they have, you know, large stretches of the year where they're not getting sun exposure? In those cases, I would say the, the more that that is true or, of you, or if, even if you live in a place with sun exposure, but you just don't make time for it, um, the more that is true, the bigger, the, the more necessary it will be for you to do lots of, of red and near infrared light therapy, lots of sauna exposure. Um, and, and you will get more benefits from those things if you are more deficient in sunlight. Now, with sun, this is a tricky one. This is, you know, this is something that probably we could do an entire podcast on because the research here is remarkable, but also really like goes against a lot of the common typical advice that's been out there for 10 or 20 years, which is avoid the sun. The sun is bad for you. The sun will give you skin cancer. The sun will accelerate your skin aging and stay away from the sun because you're going to get melanoma and die. You know, so everybody's learned to kind of cover themselves up and stay out of the sun. And if you go in the sun, then you got to wear sunscreen and, you know, all these this kind of fear mongering over the sun. The reality is, if you actually look at the data and the data is pretty darn conclusive as of 2018, we know that those habits, that lack of sun exposure is profoundly harmful to health. Um, it, it is, there's actually some data that has quantified this. There was a, a study based out of Sweden where they tracked, I think about 30,000 women. It was a huge study that they tracked them over I think 20 or 30 years. And they actually looked at disease and mortality outcomes. And what they found at the end of the day, when they, when they crunched all the numbers is that 
not getting sun exposure, the people in the, the lowest levels of sun exposure compared to the people at the highest levels of sun exposure, that was related to disease risk and mortality risk. That's the, the risk of dying in that certain span of time. It was as powerful as a factor. Sun avoidance was as harmful to your health as smoking a pack of cigarettes a day. Wow. So yeah. if you want to actually like quantify how bad it is for you to not get lots of sun exposure, that's how bad it is for you. It's on par with cigarette smoking. Yeah, I absolutely believe that my father died from, from malillumination mm -hmm. because he developed esophageal cancer at 68 years old and passed within six months of his diagnosis. He was white as a sheet. He never went in the sun, you know, because we had family members that had skin cancer removed and all this evidence and, you know, the sun was bad for you at the time, you know, in the 80s and 90s and all that fear mongering. He yeah. never went in the sun for any reason. Never, yeah. never went in the sun. Yeah. And, and I, I actually talk to a, a lot of people, you know, I have my, my energy blueprint program. We have over 2000 members in the, in the Facebook group. So to have conversations with people daily and we do coaching daily. And, um, the amount of times that I've asked somebody, how much sun exposure are you getting? And this is before they go through my program and learn about all the science around this. But, um, the amount of people who start out and I ask them how much sun they're getting, I am just shocked that probably at least 50% of these people say that they really never get sun exposure. Like maybe they get it when from walking from their house out to their car or from their car in the parking lot into their office or something like that. Getting their People, vitamin D. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, they're almost get, they're getting very, very little. Most people it's on the order of minute, a few minutes per day, if that, and probably not even at the right times a day to get UVB and, and the proper doses. Um, or I should say UVB, uh, period, <laughs> in the proper doses takes a certain amount of time. But um, there's, a, there's a huge epidemic of sunlight deficiency. And, um, you know, there's, there's some nuances to discuss here. I, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this topic because I think we've already gone about an hour. And I mean, this is something we'll probably talk about for an hour. Yeah, I think but, keep going. <laughs> but, um, you know, in, in terms of this, so we can look at, for example, melanoma. Now, let's say you just look at, instead, so right, basically we have a full pie, let's say, of all of the research on sunlight with regards to, you know, 100 different disease outcomes and mortality outcomes and measures of health and things like that. Now, one little sliver of that pie is sunlight and melanoma. Okay. Now, even there, the research is actually pretty complex. This is not just a simple case of more sun equals more melanoma. So I'll give you an example of why it's complex. Rates of, of skin cancer are actually lower in outdoor workers as compared to indoor office workers. Just think about that for a moment, right? If more sun leads to more melanoma and skin cancer, how could it be possible? And what planet would it be possible that people who work outdoor jobs and spend hours a day in the sun all year round would have lower rates of skin cancer than office workers? Makes absolutely no sense. So what, one of the tricky parts of this data is that sunburn is bad and can absolutely cause DNA damage in your skin that can absolutely manifest as skin cancer. It is also true that there are complex interactions between a person's diet and lifestyle habits and their degree of skin resistance to UV exposure, to be able to tolerate it healthy, healthfully without getting DNA damage, without getting sunburn. Um, so where, where it becomes really problematic is when you take somebody who's mostly indoors, like typical indoor office workers, and then they go on, let's say, vacations where they get tons of sun exposure, they get burned really heavily, and when that happens you know, several times each year. Well, that's the kind of thing that can in, 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 in eventually manifest as a type of skin cancer. Whereas in contrast, somebody who's an outdoor worker who gets consistent daily sun exposure and their skin has built up an adaptation to that via melanin, via a tan, that melanin actually works to, it's, it's what's called a photo acceptor. It absorbs UV light and basically helps prevent DNA damage in your skin. So the skin adapts um, because UV light is also a hormetic stressor, by the way, and our skin adapts to it to become more resilient to that. And in the process, by doing consistent 
light exposure in the sun on a daily basis or near daily basis, all of a sudden skin cancer rates get lower. So again, sunburn is bad. Going from very little sun exposure to very heavy sun exposure in bursts is problematic. Consistent daily sun exposure, especially when paired with good lifestyle and nutrition habits. And there's lots of different nutrition habits like polyphenols and various kinds of colorful plant foods that will enhance your skin's resilience to, to sun exposure. Um, that is actually a wonderfully good thing. But let's just say, this going back to this pie. So we look at this one sliver of pie in the relationship to sunlight and skin cancer risk. Let's just grant that, let's, let's say that overall body of evidence says that sunlight exposure is harmful to outcomes of melanoma and is a problem for, for melanoma. Okay, fine. Now let's look at the other 99% of this pie. Let's even look at all of the dozens of other types of cancer in relation to, to sun exposure. And all of a sudden, we look at all these different diseases, all these dozens of types of cancer, all of uh, you know diabetes and heart disease and neurodegenerative diseases, and we, see, we look at that entire body of evidence, and now all of a sudden we see, oh wow, sunlight exposure is linked with positive health outcomes on almost every other disease outcome <laughs> imaginable. So basically what I'm saying is, in term, if you look at that whole pie, the, the data that sunlight is beneficial to health and helps prevent disease and, prevents, and helps prevent early death and extends longevity is just overwhelming. I mean, it's just so amazingly positive that it's just, it, it's, it's mind boggling how we've all ended up in this position where everybody's afraid of the sun because of skin cancer. So anyway, that's, that's sunlight. For you. Yeah, <laughs> I would I would definitely hook line and sinker. I was sold on that bill of goods and I would, used to wear gloves when I was driving. I used mm. to have an umbrella going to classes <laughs> when I went to USC. I was just totally overboard yeah. uh, fear of aging from the sun. And now I'm just frying my skin as much as possible <laughs> every yeah. day when I'm, and I feel great. You feel there's a reason you feel really good after you go in the sun. It energizes your body in, in addition to so many health benefits. Yeah, yeah, absolutely right. And, um, and it's because we need, again, this is a necessary nutrient for our health. Um, we need sun exposure to be healthy and not getting it is the equivalent of smoking a pack of cigarettes every day. So, um, yeah, so I mean, you know, in terms of dose, I'm a big advocate of bigger doses, the amount of doses that I personally get, you know, I spent three hours surfing this morning, um, you know, and I was getting sun exposure, then I went, I got home, I wanted to spend some time with my son, so I took him to the beach for an hour and a half and played with him at the beach for, uh, you know, for, for another hour and a half, getting sun exposure that whole time. Well, I don't get burned because my skin is adapted to it because of consistent sun exposure plus a great diet. So I, I don't even get close to, to being burned by spending five hours in the sun. Um, so my recommendations are... Lots of sun, and and for most people living in the Western world, it's in in terms of the actual dose you're getting. I would say it's almost impossible for people to overdo it. The only caveat to that is don't get sunburned. You have to do this in a smart, systematic way that's slow and progressive. And literally, you may start with three minutes. If you're somebody who's very pale skin, very fair skin, um, I forget the exact what the, the, they have specific names for the skin types, but certain people, for example, of, of Irish or certain Scandinavian uh, ancestry sometimes have really pale skin that is uh, pretty intolerant to sun exposure. The doses for those people are, are certainly going to be a lot less than for people like me with more of a Mediterranean ancestry and more olive skin or people like um, you know from equatorial environments or people from Africa with very dark skin. Um, with African ancestry, you know, the, so the skin factor plays a role here for sure. Um, and some people may need to start with just three minutes, you know, of midday sun and that's their starting point. And then, you know, maybe they rest today and uh, take a break from it the next day. And then the next day, maybe they go to four and a half minutes and you literally start that and maybe work your way up over the course of weeks and months to the point where you can tolerate 30 minutes or 45 or minutes or an hour or something like that. But in terms of the actual amount that would benefit our physiology, um, it's if we look at our hunter gatherer ancestors, it's probably on the order of hours of sun exposure a day. 
um, which seems like an enormous amount and is for the average Westerner and is too much. It, it will result in sunburn for the vast majority of people if they try to do that initially. So, uh, you know, this is something that you have to build up to. It's sort of like saying it's sort of the equivalent of, of exercise. Like, you know, is running a marathon good for you? Well, if you're really fit and you're able to run a marathon and it's not really that even that amazingly taxing for you, then maybe I'll give I'll give the example of five miles as a, as a better example because <laughs> a marathon a marathon's okay. a lot. OK, so <laughs> it's five miles, uh, you know, of running um, a, a really like is that a is that a really hard thing? Well, for some people, it's pretty easy. They might be able to run 10 miles pretty easily. They can run at a fast pace. No big deal for them. But if you take an average sedentary person who's not doing any exercise and hasn't run since they were in, you know, junior high school PE class, well, you know, and you ask them to run five miles, that actually becomes a very damaging thing to them. Um, it becomes literally harmful on a biological level because it's, it's an overwhelming amount of stress at the cellular level that actually creates damage. So same concept with exercise is that you have to start wherever you're at and then build up your tolerance over time and let your body adapt. And, and as the tolerance increases, then you can do more and more and get benefits from more and more. And do you have any tips for us for red and red uh, light therapy and near infrared therapy? Yeah. So th there are specific doses. It's actually pretty complex, to be honest with you. And it depends also on the specific light device that you're getting and what's called the power density, which is sort of like the, the, the amount of light photons basically being emitted from that light. And it's in, in calculated in, in the context of the surface area of that light as well. Um, I'm going to overwhelm you with a little bit of complexity here, but and then, I'll, and then I'll simplify from there. But if you have a really big device, well, then you have to be concerned with like total body dose. So there's total body dose across like all body parts that you need to be aware of. There's also the right dose for specific areas that are being treated. So, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the, the right dose for treating the, the facial skin for anti-aging purposes is a very different dose than for treating you know, muscles and tendons for tendonitis or, or pain or arthritis or um, for accelerating muscle growth and strength and, and recovery and things like that, or, or for fat loss or for treating the brain. Um, you know, so these, these require radically different doses. Um, the, the, the doses are measured in something called joules. Uh, and basically, to, to give you an idea, the, the right dose for, let's say, skin anti-aging might be on the order of, let's say, 3 to 15 joules, somewhere in there. The right dose for treating tendonitis or deep tissues, organs, glands, the brain, muscles, things like that, um, might be five times higher than that or 10 times higher than that. So, um, you know, let's say if you gave five joules for facial anti-aging, maybe you'd want to give 50 or 80 joules, even potentially 60, something like that for treating some really deep tissues, um, you know, like muscles or tendons. Um, so there's orders of magnitude difference just based on the specific context of what exactly you're treating. Then you need to know in order to calculate that, you have to know how powerful your, your device actually is. So what device are you using? What's the amount of what's called the power density, the amount of uh, the intensity of the light output. And then you can calculate, okay, well, my light's this big, it's emitting this much power density. That means it's got this many joules per minute. Let's say it's one joule per minute or two joules per minute. So that means if I do five minutes, then I'm getting, you know, two, two joules per minute, five minutes. That means I'm getting 10 joules. Okay. So that's a good dose for my face, right? So that's basically how, how you have to calculate it. Um, that's if you go and get like just any random devices, you actually need to know those numbers to do the proper dosing. Now in my book, I give several recommended devices and I've actually done all the measurements beforehand. So I give all the numbers of like, here's the actual power density numbers. And then based on this for, let's say skin anti-aging purposes, for muscle and tendon treatment, for brain treatment, for treating deep tissues versus superficial tissues, what are the, the proper doses? And it's literally just broken down. I know this is all seems really complex, but it's all just broken down like, hey, if you have this light and you want to treat deep tissues, 
then you know use it for five to ten minutes. If you have this light and you want to treat skin anti aging, then use it for you know one to four minutes, for example. Okay, so that's that's the basic gist of how much all of this complexity can just be simplified into very practical, easy recommendations. Yeah. So just get the book and then you can have all <laughs> this laid out for you. So what are your favorite recommendations for near infrared and red light panels and even for the far infrared saunas? Yeah. So my, there, there are a few companies that make really high quality devices. Um, in particular, I would say there's a company called Red Therapy Co. And they make a, a light called Red Rush 360. Um, it's a 360 watt light. It's about this big or so. Um, and if people are listening to this and not watching, it's about, I think it's like 18 inches long, something like that. Um, but it's extremely powerful. So the cool thing about even though that light is not necessarily like a full body size light, it's not six feet tall, it's very powerful. So you can actually move it away from you a, a significant degree, like two feet or three feet away from you even. And um, it will still be in therapeutic doses for skin anti-aging. Now, the benefit of that is that um, light spreads out the further it is away from you. So by having the device two or three feet away from you, um, you can actually now treat in terms of skin anti-aging, you can treat almost your entire body. So even though the, the light device is 18 inches long, you can now treat, let's say, five feet of your body, um, almost the entire body, basically. So you don't even really need a full length uh, light device. Now, that's, I would say, my number one choice. Uh, Juve also makes high quality lights. They're significantly more expensive, but also high quality lights, um, slightly less irradiance. Um, and in terms of equivalent sized lights and um, equivalent priced lights or similarly priced lights, uh, the, the Red Rush is going to be a more powerful light. But Juve makes high quality lights as well. Uh, there's another company called Platinum Therapy Lights that, um, that makes also powerful lights that are pretty well priced. Uh, so those are, those are my top three recommendations for like a general use LED panel. There are also potentially specific specific things that you can can get like a Violight, which is meant to treat the brain specifically. So it's kind of like a head unit. It's about $1,700. So significantly more expensive. Um, that's, that's used for treating brain sp specific issues. So that's another potential option. There's also like hair loss specific devices. Um, there's a few other specific applications, but the the general use LED panel can be used for almost every application. So I would say if you go with one of those three brands that I just recommended, uh, those would be the best bets. I also have discount codes uh, set up with these companies. So if people want to use my discount code, they can get like 40 bucks off 40, 40 or 50. I think Juve doesn't offer a, a discount uh, anymore, but the other two companies that I mentioned uh, do offer a discount. So if people want to use the, uh, I think it's just energy blueprint when you're checking out, we'll give you, uh, I think it's like 20% off. So um, yeah, those would be my recommendations for specific devices. Fantastic. Well, all right. This has been such an interesting conversation. I know that this all the listeners who are infrared sauna fanatics and wanting more distinctions is really, you know, satisfied their curiosity for pursuing more knowledge because there's a lot of information about far infrared saunas uh, and far infrared light, but not as much about red and near infrared light spectrum. So thank you for making so many distinctions today. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you for having me on and having this discussion. I think it's a, a hugely important topic and this stuff is just, there's just a mountain of research over 3000 studies showing that this type of technology has the, the capacity to benefit so many different aspects of our health. So I thank you for having me on and uh, exposing people to this information. And tell listeners where they can find you. Uh, they can go to the energy blueprint.com. Yes. The, the energy blueprint.com. And then my book is on Amazon and it's 
uh, The Ultimate Guide to Red Light Therapy. Fantastic. Well, Ari, thanks for coming on the show. And listeners, you can find uh, my work at MyersDetox.com. I've got hundreds of podcasts, hundreds of articles about detoxification and health in general, tons of free information. If you want to get my top 10 tips to detox like a pro checklist, go to detoxforenergy.com. I've worked with thousands of clients. I've distilled down my top 10 tips for detoxification at home. Thanks so much for listening today, and I'll talk to you next week.